thanks all for coming. <clears throat> and I'm very happy to have with me today uh, Police Chief Brian Searles of the South Burlington Police Department. Chief Searles has been in law enforcement for 26 years. He has been the police chief in South Burlington uh, for five years. And uh, very importantly, he is the legislative chairperson of the Vermont Association of Chiefs of Police, an organization which has come out in support of the crime bill. And I'm also very happy uh, to have with me Susan Janko, who is the executive director of the Sarah Holbrook Center here in Burlington. And as you know, Sarah Holbrook is an organization that has been on the front line uh, in dealing with the problems of troubled youth and their families. And I'll make a statement and then we'll give it over. The people of Vermont and the citizens of our country are rightfully angry about the epidemic of crime which exists in America today. People are angry that they cannot walk the streets without fear. They are angry that their own homes are no longer safe to them. They are angry that children are carrying guns to school rather than books. They are angry that women are being battered and murdered by their partners and spouses. They are angry that children are being abused. And they are angry that drugs are destroying the lives of hundreds of thousands of young people. There are many things, in my view, that government in a civilized society should be doing. Obviously, keeping the citizens safe from violence and physical assault is one of the most important roles that a government can play and must play. And that simply is what this crime bill is all about. It seeks to address the growing epidemic of violence in America by committing over $30 billion to fighting crime, which is the largest appropriation for crime fighting in the history of the United States. The crime bill that I voted for on Thursday and which failed by 15 votes is not a perfect bill. However, in my view, there is much in this bill of major importance and value to the citizens of Vermont and to the citizens of America, and I believe that it is a bill that is worth supporting. I voted for the bill on Thursday, and barring major changes in it, I intend to vote for it when it comes up this week. I'm going to vote for it again. Any time one addresses a major issue like crime, and when one talks about an appropriation of $30 billion, which is a lot of money, it is easy to poke holes in that bill, and it is easy to tell us that the legislation is not perfect. Well, I agree. This legislation is not perfect. Let's be clear about it. But at a time when the citizens of this country are crying out for the government to begin addressing the crisis of crime, there is no question in my mind that this bill, in a dozen different ways, is a major step forward in controlling and preventing crime. It is a bill that should be supported. Now let me enumerate just a few of the provisions in the bill which I believe will have a positive impact upon Vermont and the nation. Number one, simply and straightforwardly, we need more cops on the beat. We need more community policing. At a time when cities and towns and state government in Vermont too often have to choose between raising taxes, and we are dependent upon the regressive property tax, or providing adequate police protection, this legislation will provide more than $43 million for new local and state police offices. That is a lot of money for increasing police, and that is a real need in the state of Vermont. The state of Vermont needs more police officers. We need more community policing. We need more police protection in our most rural areas. And this legislation will play a significant role in allowing that to happen. Number two, equally importantly, while this legislation is very strong on increasing police protection, on stiffening penalties against criminals so that violent offenders remain behind bars where they should be, it also provides a significant sum of money to prevent crime, to prevent crime, to keep our young people off of drugs, to stop the tragedy of violence against women before it happens, to provide alternatives so that young people do not have to turn to gangs to turn to crime. In other words, there is a significant sum of money which says let us try 
to get to the root causes of crime rather than just put people behind bars. Now, as you all know, I was mayor of Burlington for eight years. And the approach that I and the city of Burlington took during that period, which I believe worked well, and the approach that this bill takes in general, which I believe can work well, is based on a two-pronged approach to crime. When I was mayor, we significantly expanded our police force and we provided stronger war enforcement. And at the same time, we developed a number of crime prevention programs, programs that were designed to give young people, especially constructive, organized activities that would allow them to grow intellectually, allow them to grow emotionally, and give them the opportunity to do something else with their lives rather than turn to a drugs and self-destruction and crime. And that is what I think the direction we have got to go in this country, a two-pronged approach. Increase law enforcement and yet increase efforts to prevent young people from turning to crime. Unfortunately, ultimately, I'm sorry, ultimately, if we are going to address the crime crisis in America, we have got to ask ourselves a very simple question. And that question is, why is it that in the United States today, we have the dubious distinction of having on a per capita basis more people in jail than any other country in the industrialized world? That dubious distinction used to be owned by the Soviet Union, an authoritarian society, and South Africa, former South Africa, of an authoritarian society. And yet now we have that distinction. And I think clearly what we must understand is that the crime rate will increase. More and more people will be in jail unless we begin to deal with the causes of crime, unless we understand that people without hope, people without a future, people without a job, people without education will, as is currently the case, turn to crime. That's what happens. We must deal with the insanity of knowing that it costs more money to keep a criminal locked in jail today than it does to send a young person to Harvard University. While some of the bill's critics may consider prevention programs to be quote unquote pork, I strongly disagree. It is not pork to provide support for battered women's shelters so that women and their children can find protection from abusive situations. In Vermont, we do not need the O.J. Simpson case to remind us about battered women. We know that in our state last year, all six women who were murdered were killed by their spouses or their partners or their boyfriends. We know that hundreds and hundreds of other women are being battered. Preventing more women from being beaten up or killed is not, in my view, pork. We know that it is imperative to get drug addicts off of their addiction so that they will not rob and steal and murder. We know in Vermont and in the nation that it is of the utmost importance to keep young people from turning to alcohol and drugs and self-destructive activities, that it is terribly important to keep them motivated and keeping them in schools. Programs that do all of these things are not pork. They save lives, they prevent misery, and in the long run, they are a cost-effective approach for society. Let me conclude by saying that this legislation is not perfect. Very little, if anything, that comes out of Congress is perfect. But this legislation is an important step forward in dealing with the crime crisis in our country, which clearly is one of the major problems uh, that we face. Uh, now let me uh, introduce to you Brian Searles, police chief of uh, South Burlington. Why don't we move over a little bit, Susan, and let Brian uh, get in front of the mics here. Thank you. I'll, I'll be brief. I'd like to start out by uh, uh, thanking Congressman Sanders for his support of the bill and uh, for the opportunity to speak to it. Uh, obviously, the uh, law enforcement community in Vermont is uh, uh, supportive of the crime bill. We're excited about the prospects if the bill passes for uh, some help from Washington. Uh, crime, particularly violent crime, very complex problem. A lot of people have different opinions about uh, what needs to happen uh, to uh, effectively deal with crime. The thing I like about this 
bill is that it is a diversified and uh, uh, balanced uh, response to some issues. It uh, uh, has a little bit of something for everyone in it. Uh, for those people who think that the, the strong line uh, approach is, uh, is, the, is the correct approach and some think the only approach, there's uh, uh, death penalty provisions, prison construction, uh, three strikes and you're out, and, and other things. Uh, for those people who, who tend to think that prevention is the, uh, uh, is the answer, there's uh, uh, more money for DARE, recreation programs, uh, community policing strategies, uh, anti-gang strategies, and so on. I think that it's uh, time that we took this sort of diversified, balanced approach, to, approach, and I think that this bill does that in a way that no other bill that I recall has done so. As far as Vermont is concerned, uh, uh, we like the fact that this bill will mean more police officers for Vermont. We have fewer full-time police officers in Vermont than we did in the late 80s. There have been some losses as a result of uh, the economic situation. There are places in this state that are significantly under-policed, in my opinion. Uh, we also have uh, a general agreement among uh, the police chiefs that community policing needs to be uh, emphasized in the future. Everyone is trying to make the transition into those kinds of strategies. But uh, it's difficult to do so when you still have uh, the obligation to respond after the fact uh, in the more historical way. And we need some help uh, financially, economically, in order to do this. This bill has that help. But I think that uh, uh, the thing that we're most excited about is uh, the fact that it provides money for special investigation units that deal with some of the uh, uh, crimes that are, I think, most significant to the overall crime problem, those uh, involving family violence. We have a unit here in Chittenden County called the Chittenden Unit for Special Investigations. It's been together two years. It is, uh, by all reports, a great success. Uh, victims think it's an excellent project. The police think it's an excellent project. The courts and the prosecutors think it's an excellent project. But I'm concerned that we're not going to be able to hold that project together because we have financial problems. And the financial problems are that we've kind of strung this together on, uh, with uh, a little money from everybody's budget, and we're not able to uh, keep up with the cost of doing business. It's about a $300,000 project. While we're having a debate about whether this project survives, there are people all over this state who have looked at it and decided that they want to replicate it around Vermont. Well, they're going to run into the same problem unless they get some help. The crime bill has some specific help in it for these kinds of projects. I think uh, uh, this project has become so much a part of law enforcement in this county uh, that uh, it would be extremely difficult to abandon it at this time. But we need to make sure that the resources are available to allow that project to continue. Uh, the other thing that we want to do is expand that program so that it specifically deals with uh, follow-up investigations for domestic violence cases. Family violence, uh, in my opinion, is perhaps the most important uh, factor in the overall crime problem because violent families, uh, crimes like child sexual abuse, child physical abuse, are really incubators for uh, crime that comes along uh, down the road. If we don't resolve these problems uh, for our kids, then we will have a tough time dealing with crime 20 years, 50 years from now. Uh, this is a big step. I think the crime bill does some things in that regard. Uh, Susan's going to speak to the prevention problem programs in the, in the bill. Uh, let me just say that uh, uh, I was inspired to come here today and speak about this for a lot of reasons. Uh, obviously. Uh, uh, I support the, the bill, and, and most of my uh, uh, fellow uh, chiefs do as well. Uh, our association supports the bill. Uh, but we're a little concerned by the fact that uh, so much has been made of pork in this bill. Quite frankly, we don't see it. Uh, we see some money uh, that is aimed at prevention, aimed at uh, issues of cause of crime, uh, things, issues that will take some time to develop. Uh, we'll have to be patient to see the results of some of these things, but we believe they're absolutely necessary. And this balanced, diversified bill we think is a good idea.
Fine, thanks very much. Uh, Susan Jenko is the executive director of the Sarah Holbrook Center in Burlington. Let's push her for a little bit. Put your waist, Susan. Well, first of all, I'd like to just thank everybody, um, all the people in Congress who did support this bill. I've been working in Burlington for about six years in the primary prevention agencies, and I can honestly admit what people, what is hard about prevention is that it's so hard to, to see the results. Everybody wants instant results. We become a society that we're running it like our fiscal, fiscally, we want quarter results, we want profits. But I can honestly say that through the, my contact with prevention agencies, I have seen some results. I've seen more kids graduate from the old North End than I have in the last six years. And as an agency director with primary prevention, we look to how we can prevent and stop some of these potentially dangerous activities. We try to work. This bill will address families, individuals, and agencies working together. Oftentimes, we are a I feel like sometimes we have one agency doing one project, another agency doing another project, and this bill will have a collaborative, cooperative aspect to it. And we need to do that because we can't, one agency or the schools can't solve the problems, or the police department can't solve the problems, but we can all work as agencies, municipality agencies, and community agencies, and school agencies to work to solve these problems. This bill would include some money much needed for youth employment, citizen and leadership development, and oftentimes we think about citizenship, we think a long time ago, but it's a very basic program that, we, that needs to be stressed. Education programs, which will prevent the dropping out of kids of dropping out of school. It will also work with alcohol and other drug abuse prevention programs, and kids will that focus on education. And also another aspect will be recreation programs, and some of those programs will get kid, get programs into places that are, that, that they, they currently are not already. A lot of times these programs are on the outskirts of town or located in well-to-do parts of the community, and this bill will get them into places that are often not attractive for agencies to go into. But um, it is offensive that it is considered just pork and it's not a very big deal. Um, prevention, studies have shown that money put into prevention in the years to come will save, will save residents and the community seven times the money. It's, it's much cheaper to, do, to focus on prevention than wait till it gets to a crisis, wait till we have a gang and try to deal with it on that level because that level is a lot more complex, takes a lot more skilled workers. So, um, and the long-term effect of this passage of this bill will be seen. And I, would, again, would just like to commend everyone for supporting it. And on behalf of a lot of the families that I've worked with, that I just, again, thank you all. Thank you very much, Susan. Any questions? Bernie, I've heard from uh, Governor Dean, Senator Leahy, and, and you about how much money Vermont gets for this? I've heard 40 million, 43 million, and 85 million. Does anyone know well, really no, how much is in this? No, you don't know because, among other things, um, there is discretionary funding that uh, you can or cannot apply for. Um, I would say that, at least in terms, as I understand it, for police protection per se, for increased numbers of police officers, you're talking about, as I understand it, a minimum of $44 million. Equally important. Uh, as Chief Searles and, and, and Susan indicated, in terms of the struggle against domestic violence, we are talking about $8 million coming into the state of Vermont to begin to address this very serious crisis. That's real money. How about $44 million pays for how many cops? I think the general estimate is, I, I don't know, about $75,000 a police officer, is that uh, for training and benefits? And I've. Uh, I've heard a number uh, that if we were to apply for every bit of the money in the crime bill, Vermont could realize 500 police officers from this bill. However, uh, I, I, I have to stress, I don't anticipate that happening. I mean, I, I think that uh, uh, it would be perhaps uh, over a period of years that might happen, but it's not going to happen right That's away. Right. I, I would uh, guess that we don't know the, the number uh, right now, but uh, there would be something something less than that. You said 44 million for Vermont? Yes. For Minimum. 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 Yes. I'm sorry, that was solely for police protection? That's correct. Protection? We could give you, we're happy to yeah. give you, we have a fact sheet that came out uh, from the White House in terms of the breakdown state by state and where money is going for particular programs that we're happy to give you. You yeah. split with some of your normal allies in the Black Caucus on this. I mean, this is a bill that had everyone from the right wing to Maxine Waters against it. 
What about that particular issue, the Black Caucus is concerned well, so about the That's a fair Dem. question. As you know, uh, people like John Conyers and Ron Dellums voted for the bill. And there was a heated discussion within the Black Caucus on a very, very important issue that I, could, I am deeply concerned about. They were concerned about the expansion of the death penalty, and they were also concerned about the Racial Justice Act, the fear that in some parts of this country at least, the people who are being executed are more likely to be black than white. Those are absolute legitimate concerns. I voted for the Racial Justice Act when it came before the floor of the House and won by very few votes. Ultimately, as I said earlier, there is a lot in this bill that I am not overly enthusiastic about. But when you weigh all the positive against all the negative, and when you look at what the United States Congress is capable of doing, I think by and large this is a step forward for the state of Vermont in terms of bringing us more war enforcement, more police officers, more prevention programs, saving our taxpayers' money, uh, I think it's a step forward. So, what don't you like about the million Well, I think Peter like mentioned a couple of things. I think that when you talk about expanding the death penalty to make sure that if anybody goes out and kills a poultry inspector, they're really going to get it. Well, I think the murder of poultry inspectors is not exactly one of the major problems facing the United States of America. And I think, to say the least, there's a lot of political uh, chatter, if you like, and sound bites attached to this legislation. Now, we're going to get tough on crime. We're going to go after those murderers of chicken inspectors and poultry inspectors. Uh, so you're seeing a lot of sound bite action. Uh, I think um, uh, there's probably, in my view, if you look at the issue of prevention versus punishment, if you like, I would have put more effort on prevention because I think Susan's point is absolutely right. If you keep kids in school, if you get jobs for young people, in the long run, not only do you prevent crime, but you save the taxpayers substantial sums of money. But I rather invest in education and keeping kids in school and making college opportunity a, a, a realistic goal for millions of young people rather than necessarily building one more jail? Yeah, I think I would have gone the other way. On the other hand, do I think we need some more jails? Yep. Do I think we have to get tougher in certain instances? Yes, I do. So what you have is a balance here. You have more money going to law enforcement, more money going into jails. You have, on the other hand, significant sums of money going into prevention, beginning to allow us to deal with violence against women, uh, child abuse, and other very serious problems. So, Bernie, yeah. Bernie, to get those 56 Democrats or whatever it was, it was about that, who voted against this, the analysis is not only are they going to have to probably get rid of the uh, assault weapons ban, but probably cut what they have called the pork, the prevention side of this. Well, How far to get it passed? And so the indication is, uh, it's not going to have as much. You said you want more prevention. The well, I said, no, Peter asked me, I mean, Sam asked me what I disliked about it, and right, that was, I yeah, so I was comfortable voting right. with the And you would like to have more prevention. The indication is that there's going to be less. I wouldn't bet on it. In other words, one thing I can tell you, you don't know what's going on in the United States Congress. I don't know what's going on. And I'll tell you the God's truth, nobody knows. You'll be amazed at how decisions are made, usually in the last three minutes. Uh, what they need is eight people to change their votes. That's what they need, okay? They may be able to get some people, I understand that Charlie Rangel of New York is now considering uh, one of the leaders of the Black Caucus changing his vote. Others may come with them. Uh, you have some rural Democrats who might be willing uh, to come uh, back in, in, into the fold, if you like. You have some Republicans, uh, moderate Republicans, who might be willing to stand up the Republican National Committee, which I must tell you, as I understand it, has sent a letter to Republicans saying that if they vote for uh, this crime bill, they may not be get funding from the Republican National Committee for their reelection efforts. You may have some of those Republicans being a little bit bolder. But eight votes is not a whole lot. And they may pick them one at a time or, uh, or whatever. But I, I would not venture to guess what the deal is that will bring eight well, more how, votes. How much would you support, though? I mean, if the bill remains right. reasonably intact. I mean, obviously, if they get rid of all of the prevention programs and so forth, I would be very reluctant to vote for it. But I'm not the only one who would be in that position. I think there I are think many of us. The question, well, what I'm trying to get at is the conventional wisdom on this has been that if they go too far toward getting right. those people to vote That's for it right. and voted against it, they're going to start losing from that the That is exactly the left, right. Okay? Yeah. And at what point do they lose you? Andy, it's really premature to tell you that. I think basically uh, they only need eight more votes. And I think they can get eight more votes without gutting this piece of legislation. Do you support death penalty? I've never 
No, I don't support the death penalty, but Doesn't I think... Doesn't this bill add a whole yeah, lot more? Sam, there is a lot of stuff in the United States Congress that I do not support. And if I voted only for those things that I was 100% supportive of, I would vote no on every single piece of legislation which came down the pike. Okay? Uh, what this bill does, and I think Susan made this point, this bill is an extraordinarily important step forward for crime prevention, to giving young people an opportunity to have more confidence in themselves, to go out and get a job, to stay into school. And given what has happened in the federal government for the last 10 or 15 years, this is a significant step forward. Yeah, Natalie, let's, uh, yeah. Natalie. Sorry. Sorry. Brian, I have a question for you. What happens in Vermont if we don't have this kind of You said that this money is, is direly for police protection. What happens in our state with that? Well, I'm afraid. Which one? Uh, uh, we won't put Channel 5 there. <laughs> They're not interested in prevention any of They just want to know about the I'm afraid that uh, uh, the enhancement of uh, policing services uh, will be slowed or perhaps even stopped. I think projects that are experimental like QC may not start up or continue. Uh, I'm concerned about the fact that we've lost about 50 police officers statewide uh, since 1989. Uh, I uh, am concerned that there are some areas of this state where, uh, particularly after 2.30 in the morning, it's very difficult uh, to get a timely response. Uh, those things exist now. I, I think they'll get worse if we don't get this bill. And I'd like to say one more thing about the number of police officers that we could anticipate. We, the reason we don't know the answer is, is because uh, there's a lot of decisions to be made in Vermont if this bill passes by the state and by its communities about whether it's uh, how much match it's willing to raise, how much match it can raise, and what is it, uh, those communities' commitment to keep these officers employed beyond the period of the grant. Those decisions will be made at the local level where they should be made, but uh, uh, we're certain that uh, uh, it'll be a plus for uh, law enforcement in Vermont. One, uh, this, uh, this, this bill, certainly the, the procedural vote, would you agree, was certainly a testament to the continued power of the NRA? I think you had a number of factors involved, certainly including the NRA. You had the Republican National Committee uh, playing a very strong role. A and I think, again, I'm less interested in the political gossip than telling you really what's in the bill and why I think it's important for Vermont. But knowing that Peter is more interested in the political gossip, I think we want to want to address that issue, right? Thank you, Mr. Governor. There you go. Okay. Um, I think you had a, a number of elements involved in the defeat of the bill. I think, number one, very clearly, and I'm not saying this for every Republican, but at least for a certain number of Republicans, they would have voted against this bill no matter what was in it, because if it was passed, it would be seen as a plus for President Clinton. And from their point of view, anything that is good for Bill Clinton is bad for them. So Clinton could have rewritten this bill completely, could have taken out every ounce of prevention program, you know, done everything, and they would have voted no because it would have been seen as a victory for Bill Clinton. That's not every Republican, but that's some. As I mentioned before, the Republican National Committee put a great deal of pressure on many of the moderate Republicans who might have supported this. In terms of the NRA, absolutely. The NRA has mounted a major campaign to see the defeat of this bill primarily because of the ban on certain types of semi-automatic weapons. And they saw the victory last week uh, as a real step forward for them in their effort to defeat that legislation. So the NRA has played a very active role uh, in trying to defeat this legislation as well. Have they contributed to your campaign? Not a nickel, never. Bernie, where's the money coming from for this? The, matter, money, the bulk of the money will come, obviously, from the federal government. And where it comes from is uh, the effort by uh, the Clinton administration to make the federal bureaucracy uh, more cost effective. There has been, as you know, uh, a significant lowering of the number of the people uh, employed by the federal government, uh, and the savings there are going to go into the crime trust fund. Uh, and in addition to that, the states will also pick up some of the burden. So there's no, uh, is this going to add to the deficit, passing this no, bill? No, it's, it's taking money from one pot. It's eliminating certain types of what is deemed, and I tend to agree, unnecessary uh, federal uh, jobs. A lot of federal jobs have been cut in the effort to streamline the federal government. And those savings are going to go into the crime trust fund, which will then go to helping cities, towns, and, and the states. 
I'm asking that the NRA membership here in Vermont is is high. Have you done any polling? Has to see, done what? Have you done any polling here in Vermont to see what people think about the crime? Here? I think, in general, based on what. I believe to be the case is that most people in the state of Vermont, not just the police chiefs association, but most people in the state of Vermont believe that it is appropriate for the federal government to ban certain types of semi-automatic weapons. I have talked to police officers throughout the state of Vermont and throughout America. Mm -hmm. I do not believe that this action is going to have some magical and profound impact on violent crime. It is not. May it have some impact in taking away some very, very dangerous weapons from drug dealers and people who are outgunning our police officers right now, it may have some impact, and that's my view. I would say based on polling that I have seen in general, and my sentiment, you know, I'm a politician, I go out and I talk to people. My view is that a majority of the people in the state of Vermont ban, uh, support a ban on certain types of semi-automatic weapons. Another subject? Uh, let's stay on this one until we, uh, is sure. anything, uh, anything else on the crime bill? How long before the money, if it was the bill was to pass, would run out and the states would be stuck with putting Very good money? question. Very fair question. And once again, there is, this is not a placebo. This is not a magical bill. What it does do is provide a very substantial amount of federal help. And in the states, as Brian indicated, and cities and towns are going to be, have to be very, very judicious in what they accept and what they're prepared to fund. Because if in five years from now, or six years from now, there has to be a massive layoff of police officers, that's not going to be a good situation. So I think there are two issues here. Number one, it is absolutely possible, and I believe that President Clinton himself believes, that the federal funding should be continued beyond the five or six year period, that that support should be there. But that's not built into the legislation. And second of all, the cities and towns and states will have five or six years to work out what they feel that they can safely continue. So this extend for five, five year period. Yeah, that's right. Chief Searle, just one question. Are you at all concerned about the, the argument about federalizing, not just the death penalty, but the, the federal government more involved in what really most people think can only be handled <coughs> on the local level? Uh, no, there's nothing in this bill that uh, causes me concern. I mean, the federal, the the discussion that happened in another forum about the federalizing of certain crimes that have been uh, uh, state violations uh, for years uh, uh, bothers me. But there's nothing in this bill uh, that bothers me at all. As a matter of fact, I, I can remember uh, the Omnibus Crime Bill of 1968. It's about when I started in this business. And uh, uh, we made considerable progress, which we are benefiting from today, uh, from that bill. This is the, uh, uh, the biggest thing since then. And uh, I think that it recognizes uh, correctly some issues that uh, we at the uh, local level are having some problems dealing with and uh, and deals with them and I don't think that's inappropriate at all. Okay, any other questions on crime? Okay, any other questions people have? Yep. Uh, would you give us an update on the, uh, the GAO investigation on the BSD? <sighs> Well, it's still investigating. <laughs> Thank you. We will have, uh, yeah. I mean, I wish I could give you, a, yeah, yes. they're still, it's, yeah. it's, it's ongoing, it's on, as, right. as they say, yes. yes. And we you. think we are going to have results in the near future. Which is, near future is? God, yeah, I mean, that's, months, maybe. I mean, uh, yeah. these no, people no. just drag on forever. Okay. I wish I could tell okay. you something. Do you think, do you, would you, do you think there should be an investigation of dairy farmers in Vermont because of uh, word from Monsanto that, Vermont farmers who belong to co-ops that are signing affidavits saying they don't use it are buying the product. Should we I think, investigate? Well, I, I find it interesting that our friends Monsanto, who have spent huge amounts of money promoting this product, which in my view is already having a very negative effect on family farmers because milk production is increasing significantly in the West and the Southwest where this stuff is being heavily used and it is driving milk prices down and it's going to drive family farmers off of the land. I find it interesting that Monsanto, which has three high-ranking officials in the FDA who approved this drug, okay, that they are worried about an investigation right now. But having said that, Monsanto is a very, very powerful force. Uh, and uh, they get on my nerves a little bit in terms of the role they have played with regard to uh, dairy farming. Uh, I think, having said that, uh, that obviously if a company is going to say that this product does not contain milk 
from a uh, cow treated with BST, that the consumers have a right to know that that's, that's true. And we want that to be accurate. The legislation that I've introduced in Washington makes that the case. That's what you've got to do. So I think what we want to do, and I'm not going to tell the state how to go about doing it best, but I think consumers, if they're going to buy a product that says this does not come from a BSD-injected cows, they should know that that's true. So I would hope that the state will deal with that effectively. Do you think farmers, though, if there are farmers, say the St. Albans Co-op, who are using BST, that they should be uh, prosecuted for that? Prosecuted for that? Yeah, they're violating the state law. Well, I'll allow the attorney. Let me. I'm, uh, to be very honest with you, I'm not as familiar as I should be with all of these. The attorney general, I'm sure, is more familiar with it. Than, than but you think it should it. be investigated? I think that it. What I just said is that I think it is an issue of concern. I will, as not being the governor of the state, not being the attorney general of the state, having my hands full with one or two issues of some consequence for the people in Washington. Let me concentrate on those. Okay, I Natalie. Okay. From behind the camera, we see Natalie. Yes, Natalie. As you know, South Burlington's digital plant has uh, been given preliminary approval for a carpet factory. Knowing your love of the carpet industry, what do you think of this? <laughs> well, interestingly enough, you know, Peter asked me a moment ago how we're doing in terms of, of the BSD investigation, which we hope to get to you soon enough. What we should be giving you very shortly is a report on some of the changes, very positive changes, we think, uh, that the carpet and rug industry have made as a result of the work that uh, Mike Sinar and I have done. Uh, what you're looking at now uh, are the beginning of some very good epidemiological studies. Uh, you're looking at workers in Georgia who are now going to be uh, examined to determine whether or not they have been made ill and so forth and so on. My strong belief, without question, is that some carpets have made some people ill and in some instances have made them very, very ill. On the other hand, in this room, throughout this office, in Washington, and in my home, we have carpets. And if I thought that every carpet produced and every carpet laid on the floor made people ill, believe me, we would not have carpets and we would have demanded stronger action from the federal government. So obviously what we want to see, in, not only in South Burlington, but in every carpet manufacturing plant in America, is a process by which workers are protected by which the product that is being produced is environmentally sound. I have absolute confidence that the industry can do that. What are you going to do to make sure that happens in the South Carolina company? I think what we can share with the new owners is some of the information that we have received, uh, and we have reams and reams of paper on that issue. But I have not the slightest doubt that many factories, both in Georgia, where a significant part of the carpet industry lies, and throughout this country, many of the uh, factories are, in fact, very safe. But where they're not, we're going to move. And we're happy to work with the uh, new owners to make sure that that uh, carpet manufacturing plant is as safe and environmentally sound as possible. Just let me try one last time. If, would, you, uh, would it be your personal opinion that Vermont farmers who should or should not use BSD because of all the negative things you've said for the last few years about its impact? The negative things that are now coming true in terms of driving prices down and driving family farmers off the land. Is that what you're talking about? Yes. Should Vermont farmers not use BSD? I think here's the dilemma that you have, and I've talked to many farmers. This is the dilemma, and this is why what's going to happen, this is the reality of that. And I've got to tell you, on an emotional level, it really upsets me very much. Monsanto introduces the product into the industry, okay? And then what happens is farmers are seeing the prices that they get for their milk going down. So what some farmers, some in Vermont and throughout the country say, look, my prices are going down. I need more production. I've got to use BSD. Well, if that farmer was the only farmer in America using BSD, that would be very, very good. The problem is there are thousands of other farmers using BSD. The end result is farmers in general are digging a deeper and deeper hole for their own destruction. Because the more milk that is being produced, the lower the price will go. And farmers are going to work harder, produce more milk, get a lower price, and they're going to be in worse shape. And that's the dilemma that the individual farmer has. So what the individual farmer says, look, what can I do? Other people are using it. What's the end result of all of that? Monsanto will make hundreds of millions of dollars in profit. The price of milk will go down. Family farmers in Vermont will be driven off of the land. That's the end result. I cannot, you know, each farmer owns his or her own farm. They will make that decision. Ultimately, for the whole nation, I think BST is a disaster. You've talked to farmers who've told you they've used it, have you? I think I've talked, most of the farmers I have, yes, I have, actually, but I've talked, most of the farmers I've talked have chosen not to use it. Yeah.
high risk of staying here all night. I have to ask you to read the tea leaves on health care and what you think may or may not happen. This you want to know about the BSD investigation? <laughs> That's, uh, I, I think the situation, once again, is so fluid that I, I mean, this is what I've learned having been in Congress for three and a half years. There are very few people, including the leader. I used to think, I, this is true, I used to think, well, I don't agree with what the leadership is doing, but they at least know what they're doing. I have now concluded that I often do not agree with the leadership, and they don't know what they're doing. Uh, and the things change every single day. I mean, what do you have? You have, we don't know what's going to come out of the Senate. You don't know if there's going to be a Republican filibuster. You don't know whether the, you don't know what's in the Mitchell bill. I don't know if they have a Mitchell bill out. They have a summary of the Mitchell bill. I have not seen the full Gephardt bill. I mean, I know what the summary entails. Uh, the answer is it is too fluid to comment on. But let me say this. Having said that, let me say this. Um, three issues of, that I want to point out. Number one, every American and every member of the media should be extremely concerned about the role that the medical industrial complex and the tens and tens of millions of dollars that the insurance companies, the pharmaceutical companies, and the doctors' organizations have put in this effort to destroy real health care reform in this country. But you might conclude from all of this that when you're taking on a special interest as powerful as big money in medicine, that it is virtually impossible to bring real reform. I don't know, no matter what the issue is, if it is apple pie and motherhood, if you had $100 billion against you, and you had a tremendous lobbying effort, and you had millions and millions of dollars of Hillary and uh, of Louise and, uh, who was the other guy? Louise's boyfriend, Harry, her husband. Harry. Harry and Louise, and all of this stuff geared against you. I don't know that you can succeed. And that's the real story. You have enormous needs in America, and the big money interests are fighting intensely to protect their profits and their self-interest. And in Washington, the good people are losing that fight. Now, having said that, I don't know what will come out. Second point that I want to make, within the Gephardt bill, at least, what I am happy about, not happy with a lot, but I am happy that the single-payer option is in there at least the last time that I looked. And that is something that Joe Kennedy of Massachusetts and I have worked very, very hard on. I believe very strongly that the only way you're going to get comprehensive, universal, cost-effective care is through the single-payer approach. It will be done statewide. That option remains in there. A third thing that I would say is last look, God knows what happened today, I haven't been there in two days, is the uh, major piece of health care prevention, the Community Health Advisors Act, which would allow community organization to play a much greater role in disease prevention. We introduced that legislation, it's gotten a lot of support, that's in there as well. So that's the good point, but there's probably a lot more negative than good. All right? Good. Thank you all very much. And Brian, thank you very much. Susan, thanks, oh, thanks. very much. <clears throat> Any idea when they might vote on a resurrected crime bill? Maybe once they first. I think the